this morning we are blessed and honored to have Dr. Larry Bazer with us. Is that right? Bazer? Did I get it right? Um, he spent 25 years at First Baptist Church of Melbourne, and now he's currently serving. He retired from there. You know, as Christians, we never retire. God's always got a job for us to do. So now God's got him going and teaching and training pastors all over the world. Um, I know he's leaving tomorrow to go to China to be doing some teaching and uh, ministering there. So let's be praying for him. Let's ask him to come now and uh, give us the word that God's blessed him with. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. It's good to be with you this morning. I've preached here two or three times in the past, uh, all the way back when you were meeting in the old building, a revival when uh, Gene Wilbanks was there. And then when Donnie Legg came on, I, I had a sermon, I think the first night he was here as far as installation. And uh, now Dal has asked me back, and I want to correct something. Uh, I'm surprised that lightning didn't strike Jim when he was talking about my golf game. Uh, because the only time I've played your pastor, he beat me pretty soundly. And uh, I'm looking forward to playing him again in July, and I want to beat him at that time, but uh, I don't know if that'll happen or not. But, uh, you know, it takes a lot of courage for a pastor to invite another pastor to fill his pulpit and ask him to preach on Revelation. You know, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if I'd have had that courage when I was pastoring, uh, but uh, he didn't just say, come preach anything you want to preach, but would you preach from the 12th chapter of Revelation? So that's where I'm going to preach as he has been preaching in Revelation. I'm just going to continue uh, in that series uh, this morning. So if you have your Bibles, open them to Revelation 12. It's on page 1095 in my Bible. Uh, I don't know what it is in your Bible, but uh, anyway. <clears throat> have a little bit of time. I, I was going to share a story of uh, I share often in foreign countries. When it goes to a translator, it's doubly good because uh, it's about stuttering. Uh, but uh, there is a, a, a Bible company in the United States that sells these big family Bibles um, and, uh, you know, you record all your family history and births and marriages and deaths and so forth. And they usually hire college students to go house to house in rural areas to sell these Bibles. And one day a young man showed up and said, I like to sell the Bibles. Well, the recruiter, you know, didn't know what to tell this guy. He didn't want to just slough him off and say you can't do it because you have a speech problem. So he said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll give you a box of Bibles and uh, let you go out today, see what you do. And when you come back, we'll make a decision then. Well, he came back at the end of the day, he had sold every one of the Bibles. He said, son, how did you do that? He said, well, I just knocked on the door. I said, would you like to buy a Bible or would you like for me to reread it to you? So he sold lots of Bibles. <laughs> yeah, Billy Graham, Billy Graham was once asked the question, was he an optimist or a pessimist? He said, neither. I'm a realist. I've read the last page of history. I know how it ends. And the book of Revelation is not a, uh, given to us to, for us to form a bunch of charts uh, to talk about specific events at the end time. It was written to assure some discouraged and defeated Christians in the first century that even though the Roman Empire looked like it was totally in charge and was going to destroy the church in its early infant stages, that God had the last word, not the Roman Empire. And when it was all said and done, God would still be on his throne, as we saw in chapter 4, and the Lamb of God is going to come back, not as one who was slain on a cross, but as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that all will be victory in the end. It's like we sang the song, uh, when my world is shaking, heaven stands. Uh, that's the truth of Revelation. And uh, when we look at this future scene that's described in chapter 12. Now, chapter 11, you finish with the uh, seven trumpets. And in chapter 15, it'll start with the final, the seven bowls of wrath. But in between, in chapters 12 and 13, 14, there are seven personages that are uh, offered or signs that are offered by John or given by, to John. 
uh, of this end time and this battle and this war is going on. And uh, it really shows the war that's breaking out in heaven where Satan, the deceiver, the, the destroyer, is kicked out of heaven uh, to earth. And he's in his last death throes. And uh, the rejoicing begins as this accuser of the brethren is, is uh, gone. And uh, it, it talks about how they have, uh, Christians have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by their witness, their testimony, and that they were uh, faithful even unto death. So we're going to look at uh, Satan a little bit uh, as he introduces the woman, the child, and Satan, and then the overcoming part uh, that's described. Let me read the whole chapter uh, as we begin. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. And then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. And then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that she should feed her there 1,260 days. That's three and a half years. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Uh, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So that the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come uh, down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragons saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, and she, uh, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. This is again a, a three and a half year period. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And then the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And may God bless the reading of His Word. And let's pray together. Father, thank You so much for this powerful book of Revelation that continues to speak to our hearts uh, and remind us that when it's all said and done that You're still going to be on Your throne and that Christ is going to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank You, Lord, that You promised uh, the defeat of the enemy, the devil, and uh, Father, you promise that we can be overcomers. And we pray, Lord, for victory in the hearts and lives of those that are here today. And we might know where our victory rests in the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the faithfulness of our witness, and uh, being faithful unto death. And Lord, I pray that you'd raise up an army of faithful saints who will live and flesh out the Lord Jesus Christ here in this community, that many people will be born into your kingdom in days to come. And this is our prayer. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Now, he talks about uh, overcomers, and uh, that word is used uh, several times in John's writings. In fact, the Greek word is a very familiar word to us, the word Nike. Uh, my, uh, one of my granddaughters turned 13 today. Yesterday, Gail and my, my wife and I went to Orlando where she lives and kidnapped her for the evening. We took her out to the sports authority and bought her some Nike soccer shoes. Uh, she wants to be a champion soccer player, and so we got those Nike shoes. We know Nike commercials, 
But uh, the word is, uh, means to, to conquer, to overcome, to vanquish, to subdue, to prevail. And it's one of John's uh, favorite words. He uses over 17 times in his Gospels, in his letters, and then in Revelation. And so he's going to talk about how we overcome, especially this dragon that he introduces, Satan, uh, in chapter 12. Now, before he talks about overcoming, he introduces us to a woman in verse 12, in chapter 12. And, uh, and uh, I would suggest this woman represents uh, Israel. Israel. Uh, if, and we might ask the question, if she bore a male child uh, that was Jesus, why wouldn't we say that this is Mary? Well, in the context, this is much bigger than a woman, much bigger than Mary. And when he talks about the 12 stars, uh, and uh, at her feet, and uh, the sun and the moon, really reminds you of a scene back uh, in Genesis, in chapter 37, when, when uh, Joseph, you remember, has a dream of his brothers bowing down to him. His first dream, uh, their sheaves bow down to worship his sheaf uh, of wheat. And then later on, he had another dream where he said that all the, the, the stars, the moon and the sun, bow down to me. And uh, he was referring to his mother's father, and the whole nation uh, would bow down to him. And so, uh, this is speaking of, of, of Israel. And uh, uh, when we think of, of the, the whole line of the Bible, of, of the line of Christ, it starts out with one man, Adam, uh, or, or as, in creation through Adam. And, and then through one man, Abraham, in chapter 12 of, of Genesis, where God calls Abraham uh, to be the father of many people, the nation. Of Israel, and then through uh, Abraham, you remember he had uh, Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, who had the twelve tribes. And of those twelve tribes, one tribe, the tribe of Judah, was designated as being the ruling tribe. And from the tribe of Judah, one family, uh, David. And so we find this coming down through him to present the Savior. And so we see the male child, uh, the Christ, and what is said about this child. He says. He, he was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And this is really a quote of the Messianic Psalm, uh, Psalm 2, and uh, where God is, is uh, our Christ is, is pictured as the ruler of all the nations. And, uh, and then he's called up to God and to his throne. This is, refers to the ascension in Acts 1, uh, 9, after he had given that uh, uh, great commission uh, it says that the, the disciples stood by while they saw Jesus ascending up into heaven on a cloud. And two men stood by and said, why are you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that you saw ascending is going to come down in like manner uh, one day. Now, uh, this, this picture, he is caught up in the air, is the same word that is used in 1 Thessalonians 4 to talk about the church being caught up in the air. We use the term the rapture of the church which I believe happens at the very beginning of the tribulation period, uh, right before chapter 4. And I checked with you, Pastor, to make sure his theology was the same as mine so I could share that. But uh, anyway, so he talks about Christ being caught up and the church has been caught up already uh, in this rapture of the church. And then it's interesting what is not said about Jesus. You know, it talks about his birth talks about his future rule and, and talks about his ascension, but nothing is said about his death and his resurrection and his life. But the rest of the chapter is really devoted to the dragon, uh, to Satan, and, uh, and then our victory over him. And I get excited when we talk about this subject of our victory. I, I don't know about you, but I like to win. Uh, I was disappointed when I played your pastor and he beat me. And so I'm ready to play him again so I can beat him. Uh, when I play games with my grandkids, I still want to win. Uh, I'm not as cutthroat as I used to be, but uh, uh, I like to win. And uh, so this idea of being an overcomer is exciting uh, to me, and I hope it will be to you. But the dragon is pictured in verse 3. And uh, this is a sign appeared in heaven, a, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. And uh, Warren Wiersbe says, the heads and the horns and the crowns will appear again in Revelation 13, 1 and 17, 3. And they represent mountains and, and the horns represent kings. And uh, with his tail in verse 4, it says, he drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And many people believe this refers to a time in, in uh, heaven past 
when uh, Satan uh, rebelled against God and his authority, and you remember it in, in Isaiah 14 where he says, I will be like the Most High. Uh, I will be worshipped. And, uh, you know, the worship that belonged to God he wanted for himself. And, uh, and so God kicked him out of heaven. But he took along with him a third of the angels. Uh, these stars would represent these uh, demons that went with him. And, uh, and so he has a great host of followers and one reason he's able to accomplish so much uh, devastation and destruction in our world is because he has all these demons working with him. But um, we know that uh, uh, they followed him. The one who formerly had been a prime minister of the angels in heaven probably was the worship leader, Todd. You got to be careful there. You know, that uh, uh, he, he again wanted the praise that was only due to God. Now he's portrayed by several words, this arch enemy of God, he is called the dragon, uh, which shows his fierce, destructive nature. He's called the serpent because of his crafty and cunning nature, as he did with Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, where he enticed them to disobey God. He is called the devil, which means slanderer or accuser. And we're going to come back to that term in just a minute. And then uh, the word Satan means adversary. I want to remind you that another church down the road is not your adversary. Another denomination is not your adversary. Another person is not your adversary. Our adversary is the devil and uh, not anybody else. And, and don't ever forget it. Uh, we, we sometimes start attacking people when the real enemy is, is Satan. And we need to know that. And then he's called the deceiver. And uh, Jesus said he is the father of liars in John 8:44. And so this is a, a pretty a gross picture of who Satan is, but a good, pretty complete picture uh, to describe him and his actions in our life. Now his purposes, one was to attempt uh, to, to prevent the birth of this male child. From the very beginning in Genesis uh, chapter 3, when, when man and woman sinned, you remember that God gave the first uh, promise of a Messiah. He said the seed of woman would come and crush the head of, of, uh, of the serpent. And this was a reference to a Messiah to come. And so Satan was looking for that seed of woman. And he tried to kill one of her first sons, remember, through Cain, uh, killed uh, Abel. And uh, later on, he, uh, he tried to, uh, through, through, uh, to kill Moses and uh, to kill uh, all the Hebrew babies uh, in Egypt. In the, the time of Esther, uh, through Haman, he tried to kill all the Jews once again. And of course, the most notorious is at the birth of Jesus through Herod, the great, killing all the babies uh, two years and under in Bethlehem. And, and so he is, he is out to uh, attack the birth of the child, not knowing when he would come. Uh, he just went after all the Jews uh, along the way. And, and we read about this anarchy in heaven in verses 7 and 8. Uh, where Michael, the archangel, is in battle with Satan. And uh, Michael seems to be the commanding general of the Lord's armies, and he opposes Satan in heaven and on earth. And at this time, Satan is kicked out of heaven. Now, I don't know what this does to your theology, but uh, to think, now this is describing a scene way in the future, or sometime in the future, where Satan uh, is in heaven. He said, well, wait a minute, I thought Satan was in hell all this time. No. Uh, he has access to heaven. Uh, you remember the story of Job. As the sons of God were gathered around Jesus one day, this council of the sons of God, Satan showed up and uh, began to, uh, as, as God uh, lifted up Job as a, a perfect specimen of righteousness. And you remember how Satan attacked uh, God and his viewpoint of, of Job saying, hey, you put a hedge around him. If you take that hedge down, he'll curse you to your face. And uh, God allowed him to do that. But Satan had access to God. That's what I want you to see. But right now, uh, Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. Now, I don't know if you've had this experience. I have had many times. I'm just walking along and minding my own business. And all of a sudden, I have a thought, a flashback of something bad that I did five years ago, 10 years ago, sometimes 20 years ago because I'm getting older now all the time, maybe 50 years ago, okay? And, and I remember these things, and I get to feeling so low and so terrible that I did that horrible sin in my life, and I begin to confess it to God. And God says, time out. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. 
And I said, God, you're, you're omniscient. You know everything. How can you not know that sin I did way back then? And God says, I distinctly remember you confessing it, and I forgave you, and I remember it no more. Now, now where did that, that accusing, condemnation, guilt come from? came from the devil, the accuser of the brethren. Uh, because the Bible teaches us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. That's called God's bar of soap, by the way, for us. If we confess, he will cleanse, he will forgive, and he remembers our sin no more. And, and so when we have those flashbacks, we need to determine, uh, is this from the Holy Spirit convicting us of sin, or is it from the unholy spirit over something we have already confessed to God? And if that, he is trying to condemn us, he's trying to accuse us, he's trying to destroy us. Uh, I know that Satan, and I can picture him in, in one ear of the Father, and he's saying, you know, Larry Bays is a sorry rascal. He's done this, 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 this. And, and he shouldn't be preaching. He shouldn't be going teaching pastors in China or anywhere else in the world. Uh, he's a no good rascal. And uh, the good news is, 1 John 2 says, we have an advocate with a father who has the other ear of the father. He's the best Perry Mason. And you've got to be a certain age to know who Perry Mason was. But, but he has the ear of the father. He's our lawyer. And he says, you know, God, everything that Satan said about Larry is true. But one thing he left out, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And there now is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, who walk according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. And so we have this advocate with the father, Jesus Christ. And uh, we need to be reminded that when the accuser comes, we need to send Jesus to the door <laughs> to answer him. Now, this is something I learned years ago, and uh, I've tried to share it uh, along the, the years. That, uh, and, and let me say this, women especially, because you have a more tender conscience than us men. Uh, we tend, once we, you know, something happens, we put it behind us and we move on a lot of times. But women... Because your conscience uh, are your, your, is so tender, you, you, the devil uses this in your life too many times. Uh, these flashbacks, these remembrances of things. And, and you get feeling so low that you have to reach up to scratch the belly of a snake. You know, you're, you're just down. And, and he's got you right where he wants you. If you're living in condemnation and accusation, uh, you're no use for the Father at that point, right? And so you need to learn that when he comes knocking, reminding you of things in your past that you've already confessed to the Father, send Jesus to the door. <laughs> he has to back down from Jesus. Greater is he that's in you, right, than he that's in the world. And so trust the power of Jesus over Satan to answer. Now, you can't stand up to him. I can't stand up to him, but Jesus can and so send Jesus to the door, and he has to back down, back away, uh, and, and you move on. Now, I, I literally would, would, would speak this out loud when I first learned this principle. You know, Jesus, he's there again. <laughs> you know, he's accusing me of that, that I've already confessed to you. Will you take care of him? And, and gradually, Satan stopped coming as often in that kind of attack in my life. And uh, I learned the power and the victory was in Christ. And we're going to look at that again in just a moment. And, and so we see a, another application of this. Not only is he the accuser of the brethren, but sometimes he gets us in the same mode of accusing the brethren. You know, it's called gossip. You know, and, and we attack one another and accuse one another. Uh, I like what uh, Harry uh, Ironsides has said, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Let's leave the dirty work to him. It's unbecoming of a Christian to help Satan in his slanderous, dirty work. Amen? And, uh, you know, you have something against your brother. What should you do? Go to him. Talk to him face to face. Uh, if you have something against your pastor, don't start spreading stuff among everybody. Go to your pastor. Talk to him face to face. I can't think of how many times I, that I hurt people in my ministry that if they'd just come to me, we could have straightened it out right quick. You know, I would apologize to them if I had said something to offend them or they had took what I said out of context. Uh, but we try to teach this principle in our church over and over again. Go to the person that has offended you and talk to them and share with them your hurt and, and, and get it resolved. 
Don't be slanderous and gossiping uh, behind the back of one another. But you see, his attack of the Jews, especially, and the people of God on earth, uh, there was rejoicing in heaven <laughs> that Satan was kicked out. But on earth, uh, the devil knows he has a short time. And uh, he's on a short leash. You remember the uh, Gadarean demoniac uh, that when uh, Jesus spoke to the legion of demons in, in, the, in, in him, that they said, do not torment us before our time. They knew there's a time coming that they're going to be tormented. And, and so they requested to go into those swine uh, in the meantime. Uh, so, you know, the devil knows his time is short. And especially when we come to this scene in, in uh, Revelation, he knows that he just has a, a very short time. And so he begins to persecute the woman, the Jews. And uh, Satan is behind every anti-Semiticism uh, activity in our world today. And folks, it's going on all over our world today. It didn't stop at the Holocaust. Uh, it, it's still going on in our world today. And, and we need to be aware of that and, and be a friend to Israel and uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Jews were able to escape into the wilderness. We don't know where. If you read the Tim LaHaye Left Behind series, uh, he, he talks about them going to Petra. And I was able to go there this last year, and it is a beautiful uh, place of defense. I mean, very narrow canyons, I mean, high, high steep mountains, and it could be defended against a, a, a much superior army uh, because there was only a narrow entrance into that uh, valley. If you saw Raiders of the La Lost Ark, you saw Petra, you know, as, uh, as uh, Harrison Ford, you know, went in there. But anyway, that was filmed at Petra. But uh, that may have been where, where the Jews will escape during this time. And, and it says that there's a flood that comes from the mouth of the dragon trying to, to, to uh, destroy this, uh, this child or the people of Israel. <clears throat> and this is uh, the floodgate of propaganda that continues to come out. Uh, you, you read the papers all the time of what, uh, you know, uh, attacking the Jews and where they are today. And, and so that's going to happen. And then... Uh, the Bible says the earth helped the woman. It swallowed up the flood. And this enraged and thwarted the devil so much that he begins to a full out attack on the people that are left behind. And you remember we talk, they talked about the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, the Billy Grahams that are out there reaching the world for Christ during this period of time. And, and so he's attacking those people, those new believers, uh, because he knows he's lost it with the son and he's lost it with Israel. And, uh, and so we learn about the devil several things. One is he is not omniscient and not omnipotent. Now hear me. The Satan is powerful, but we don't need to overestimate him. He does not have the same knowledge that God has, or he would never would have allowed Jesus to die on a cross if he knew the resurrection was to come, would he? You know, he didn't know about the resurrection. And, and uh, he is not omnipotent. He cannot stand up to Michael and uh, unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, yeah, he cannot stop the plan of God, the purposes of God for all time. Also, uh, we need to expect the adversary to oppose us. You know, uh, he, he's not worried about a Christian that never prays. He's not worried about a Christian that never opens his mouth to share his faith. He's, never wor he's not worried about uh, a Christian who lives an inconsistent life. I mean, he's got that person where he wants them. Someone said, if you did not meet Satan this morning, uh, it's a sure sign you're walking in the same direction. Now, think about that. You know, we have an enemy, and uh, sometimes it helps to be known uh, who, who your enemies are, to be known as an enemy of Satan, right? And, uh, and, and so we see the, the, this idea that, that we have an enemy, we need to know uh, that we have an enemy. But right now, he is the accuser of the brethren. And so the question is, how do we get our victory? How do we overcome uh, Satan uh, during these days as he is attacking us and accusing us? And, and the Bible gives uh, the answer uh, in three things that he mentions here. And that is, they overcame him through the power of the blood and through the their witness of their testimony, and then that they were faithful unto death. Let's look at those three things very quickly. And uh, Christ's blood is the only answer. He is the way, 
We sang several songs this morning. That was interesting. Todd was praying with me before the service and prayed that uh, the music would uh, complement the message and all. And it did perfectly, Todd. You know, it's amazing to me how the Spirit of God works all that out uh, and reminds us that it is our defense is the blood of Christ. And, and it's the route that God has chosen all the way through the Word of God. I mean, from the first book, you remember when, the, when Adam and Eve sinned that they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. I don't know if you've ever picked figs, but I tell you, those leaves are itchy, itchy. That, they could not have been comfortable clothing uh, for, any, for anybody for any length of time. But God killed an animal, causing blood to be spilled. And from those animal skins, he fashioned and shaped clothes for them. But blood had to be spilt for a covering for their sin and their shame. And that's the first reference we have to the blood. But then you, you, you follow on in, in uh, Exodus and for the children of Israel to be delivered from the Egyptians, you remember they put blood on the doorposts after they killed a lamb. And from side to side, from top to bottom, when, when God's death angel saw the blood, he passed over. He saved and rescued the children of Israel. And uh, in Leviticus, well, we read about uh, the scapegoat and uh, the two goats that offered on the Day of Atonement. And uh, one, uh, one animal was killed. The blood was taken into the Holy of Holies by the high priest and put on the altar or put on the, uh, the mercy seat which covered the Ark of the Covenant which housed the Ten Commandments that had been broken by the children of Israel in that past year. And when the blood was sprinkled, <clears throat> God propitiated or His, his wrath was uh, satisfied. Propitiation is a word. Uh, the mercy seat, that's all the same word, was covered for another year. And uh, pointing toward the propitiation that Christ would be for our sins, satisfying the wrath of a holy God. And, and, uh, and then the other goat, you remember, they took the blood that was on his hands. He came out and put him on the horns of another goat. And that goat was released into the wilderness to symbolize there is a scapegoat for our sins. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he remembers our sin no more. And, and you come to Psalms, and Psalm 22 is, is a beautiful picture of Christ on the cross. Uh, and then you come to the prophets, and you find Isaiah talking about, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and he opened not his mouth. How he gave his life for his people. Uh, the Lord laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. And then we come to the New Testament. The Gospels is all about the record of the death of Christ uh, the blood that was shed for our sins. And in Revelation 5, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Hebrews 9 talks about without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And we sing the song, the way of the cross leads home. It's through the blood. It's through the blood. It's through the blood that our victory is won because it is the blood that guarantees our conversion, is redemption and reconciliation. It's the word that brings communion and fellowship with God. First uh, John 1, 7 uh, talks about how we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us, what? From all sin. And it's the blood of Christ that allows communion with him and cleansing. We talked about First uh, John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And then in chapter 2, there is now no condemnation. He says, my little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, there's that word again, the, the, for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the whole world. And so we see, again, the blood of Christ is what gives us the victory. Uh, and, and we should never forget it and never get away from the cross and uh, the precious blood of Christ. And if you want to have victory over the accusations of Satan, go to the cross, go to the cross, go to the cross. And find a Christ who through his blood has cleansed you from all sin and uh, has assured fellowship with the Father. And he says also our victory is through the word of our testimony. Uh, we overcome the devil through the outward act of sharing our faith in Christ. And I have very rarely seen a Christian who is sharing their faith who is struggling uh, with temptation and sin uh, with the devil. Because that person is an overcomer. 
And uh, one way we share our confession of faith is through the waters of baptism, through a public commitment of our life to Christ. As uh, when a pastor usually finishes uh, his message, he gives an invitation and an opportunity for you to publicly confess and testify, I belong to Christ. I'm not ashamed of him. I take my stand with Christ. And we do that in baptism. And we do that when we profess him uh, with our lips. And I encourage you uh, to know that as you share your faith, you are showing those signs of victory, of overcoming, uh, just as I believe uh, we owe Paul, the great missionary of the faith, we owe Paul uh, to Stephen. I believe when, when Paul stood at the death of Stephen and, and uh, he couldn't answer his, his, uh, his uh, uh, debate back in chapter 6 when he was debating that Christ was indeed the Messiah, and so they stoned him. And as he was being stoned, you remember Stephen is looking up into heaven, seeing Christ standing at the right hand of the Father and, and, and forgiving them for stoning him. And uh, I don't believe that, that Saul, Paul, ever got that out of his head. And on the way to Damascus, uh, that's all he could think about, the testimony of Stephen uh, that day. And, uh, and, and, and we think of other great heroes and martyrs of the faith uh, their testimony through the years and what it has meant to us. And so I don't know if our, our, uh, uh, we'll be part of that roll call of those that have faithfully shared our faith one day, uh, but really that is where the victory comes as we faithfully share our faith. And then last of all, he says they had the willingness to lay down their lives uh, for the Lord. Uh, the phrase is they did not love their lives to the death. One translation says they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, if you've ever thought about being a martyr for Christ. Now, I personally have not asked for a martyr's death, you know, but uh, if the moment comes, I've often wondered, would I be willing to die for the name of Christ rather than renounce Christ? Now, I hope I would. I think I would. Uh, and I believe that God will give grace, as we sang Amazing Grace, He will give that grace when we need it. Uh, we don't need to pray for that grace right now, but when it comes, I believe God will give it to us if we need it. And it may come. You know, the way things are going, we don't know what, what will be out there in the future. But uh, to have that willingness to lay down our life for Him. You know, Jesus, our, uh, the German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, when Christ calls a man, He bids him to come and die, come and die. Well, that's not even different than what Jesus said, is it? If any man come after me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, take up his cross, and die daily. Um, it, it's a daily death to self, and uh, the victory for us, uh, Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6. He said, uh, dead men don't sin. And he said, you were buried with Christ in baptism. And therefore, you no longer are yourselves. He says, you are co-crucified with Christ. You are buried with Christ, planted like a seed and dead. And so, uh, we who are dead no longer sin. And so, he speaks of this death that must take place in our life. We're dead to self, but alive to Christ, alive to Him. And, uh, you know, uh, if ever we're going to be an overcomer, we need to settle that issue. Am I willing to die for him? Am I? Are you? Willing to die to self, die to, to your life in order that Christ might live for you. And, uh, and so John gets this vision of the overcomers. Those who overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Those who overcome by their witness of their testimony. Those who overcome because they did not think their life more precious than death. And uh, I believe God is calling for us uh, to realize we are living in serious days today. I don't believe we're in the tribulation time. I hope we're not because I believe we'll be raptured up before that time if you're in the church, if you're Christ, in Christ. But uh, some serious times of uh, struggle are ahead of us. And God is looking for those who will be overcomers who will be the Nikes, who will be the winners. I'm going to tell you, those are those who are in Christ. I've gone through the blood of the Lamb and willing to share their testimony and do not love their life 
uh, more than death, uh, unto death. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for this portion of Revelation and a reminder to us that one day Satan, the enemy, is going to get his due. That he's going to be defeated. He's going to be kicked out of heaven. And he'll no longer be the accuser of the brethren. I thank you, Lord, for the assurance that victory is available. Victory is ours uh, through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I pray if there's a person here today that has never come to the cross, has never admitted that they were sinners and they need of a Savior, that they would be the day before it's too late, Lord, to say, I, I need Jesus. I need a Savior. I need forgiveness of my sin. I want to be in that faithful crowd in heaven, worshiping Him around the throne. I pray this morning would be the time that they would open their heart and their life to Christ. Lord, we thank you for the promise where you say you stand at the door and knock. And if any man hears Christ knocking and opens the door, that, that, that you will go in. And so, Lord, as your Spirit has spoken to people today, Lord, I pray that we would open the door of our heart and our life to say yes to Jesus. Come in. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. And, uh, Father, that you'll help us who are your children, Lord, to be faithful in sharing our witness and, uh, Lord, in our commitment unto death to be faithful. And, uh, Lord, we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.